Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to On the Verge. This is Zach Spedden, joined as always by Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens. And we are, we're coming to you live the night before the Orioles deadline to protect players from the major league phase of the rule five draft. So we're going to get into which prospects we think will receive 40 man roster spots ahead of that deadline, which ones won't and which ones could end up getting taken by other teams in the rule five draft. If they are not protected by the Orioles. We'll also look at some players who recently elected free agency as well as a wrap up of the Arizona fall league. But first we'll start off with the rule five uh, deadline. On November 15th, which will be Tuesday evening, the Orioles will have to decide which players they want to protect from the Rule 5 draft with 40-man roster spots. There are currently six open spots on the Orioles' 40-man roster, and at least three or four players who are Rule 5 eligible this season seem like locks to be protected. Over at BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com, I have a new article up that gets into some of these players, their chances of being protected, and looks at some players who might not be protected but are still notable and are Rule 5 eligible this offseason. And I'll start with the one that is the most obvious to be protected, and that is Grayson Rodriguez. Consensus top pitching prospect across baseball among certain outlets, certainly the top pitching prospect in the Orioles system. We would not be having this conversation tonight if not for the fact that Rodriguez suffered a lat strain in June that cost him a significant portion of the season ultimately kept him from going to the major leagues and earning that 40-man roster spot in season, unlike players like Adley Rutzman and Kyle Stowers, who would have been Rule 5 eligible now, but were added to the 40-man roster during the season. So, Nick, I'm going to start with you here. There really is not much more we can say about Grayson Rodriguez, but do you want to take a shot at it? I I don't have anything else to add. I mean, it's it's – at this point, I think the conversation is, is he the opening day starter or not? Like, honestly, I mean, hopefully they sign some you know quality free agents and we're talking about a veteran, but like it's it's a lock. Uh, there's no conversation. Grace Rodriguez isn't going to start next year in Norfolk unless there's some just spring training disaster. Like He's going to be on the opening day roster. We talked about it before. This is another chance. You're going to stockpile this roster, I think, with a couple of different options for that rookie of the year candidate being on the opening day on uh, being on the roster on opening day. So draft pick compensation possibly in play next year. But yeah, I mean, there's no if ands, or buts here. Grayson already gets is a lock and he's going to be in the rotation come opening day somewhere. Yeah. Uh, it, the only reason he wouldn't be the opening day starter is because I doubt they'd do that to a rookie and they want to get his innings uh, started a little bit later. Plus I think we'll probably sign and or trade for someone that could probably more justify that position. But I mean, yeah, we've talked about him to death. He's the best pitching prospect in baseball. Sorry, Yuri Perez, you haven't passed him yet. And yeah, it's a it's a no brainer, and it's exciting. It's going to be uh, fun to see him in spring training, getting ramped up for the regular season. This year's class of Rule Five eligible players is very deep on the pitching side, not quite as deep on the position player side. And we'll talk about that a little later on on the show. But the one position player who absolutely does look like a lock at this point. It's Joey Ortiz, who has long been a strong defender. And after a really slow start to the season, 
made an adjustment to his hands and started tearing the cover off the ball in July while with Double A Bowie. He received a promotion in Norfolk before the season ended and Rule 5 eligible for the first time this offseason. Bob, I think that, you know, when we look at the middle infield prospects in the system, and it's something we talk about a lot on this show because there is so much depth um, in the upper levels of the system in particular among middle infielders. Ortiz stands head and shoulders above the rest when it comes to shortstop defense. And now it looks like the bat is going to be a part of his game. Yeah, you're starting to see him in the conversation for, you know, joining some top 100 lists. I think he already is on fan graphs. And, yeah, the defense alone is enough to just be a guaranteed lock to put him on the 40 man. He will be in the major leagues at some point in 2023, barring injury, whether it's just an injury replacement for somebody else that can play great defense or, you know, the guy that can maybe win a job out of spring training or winning starting job at some point in uh, the season coming up. I think he is the the guy with the most helium, even though it's a little bit later than we expected. I think he's he's someone that I'm hoping that is sticks around in the organization. Obviously, he could be part of a big trade this offseason as well, but I'm of the belief that he should be sticking around and helping this team for years to come. Yeah, I genuinely believe that he's not being overhyped. Like it, the bat is very real. We know the defense is very real. He didn't just start showing this incredible bet in the second half of this past season. I think he started really showing that in 2021. He started in Aberdeen after you know not playing in 2020, limited games his you know draft year in 2019. So 2021 he comes out and he hit for a high average in Aberdeen, but you did, really didn't see the power. And that's you know, Aberdeen. We've talked about that for the last year. We've harped on that. Why? Uh, then he gets up to Bowie, and the average maybe wasn't there, but the power was there. And so 2022, after he's finally recovered from this surgery, he broke out average power on base percentage and got to AAA and didn't really miss a beat at all with the bat. The glove still some fantastic defensive plays, but the biggest thing for me was he did not miss a beat with the bat after he made that jump. So, yeah, I think you know he's on the 40-man and begins next year in AAA. What happens past that depends on – where the Orioles go in free agency and trades, but like, he's clearly, arguably, somewhat arguably, I think, the best defender in the system. Uh, the bat is very, very real, and I still think there's a pretty noticeable gap between where he's at now and what his ceiling is as a major leaguer. So a lot to be excited there for Joey Ortiz, and we'll just see how the offseason plays out as far as what his future holds. But for right now, as of in a couple of hours, but as we're recording this, he's going to be added to the 40-man roster. It's the number two lock behind Grayson Rodriguez. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that one of the, the takeaways from Ortiz's 2021 was how much harder he was hitting the ball. Now, we don't have a ton of stat cast data to you know point to to say, oh, the average exit velocity at Aberdeen and Bowie before he got hurt was this. But you could see it. It passed the eye test. It backed up every report you were hearing, both from people inside the organization and outside the organization. So really, when he got off to a slow start, this year, it was surprising to me because he looks like he had turned a corner in 2021, but then he broke out in a big way. And I think the other thing that's worth pointing out is that I think he couldn't pick up a bat or couldn't swing a bat until February. So a substantial portion of the offseason, he was not able to do regular activity because of a shoulder injury. Yeah, after seeing all the reports about, you know, the late start to getting back into the swing of things, literally, um, and just some of the things that were going on early on the season, I'm surprised he even started on a roster of a full season club right from opening day, but maybe that meant something to him to be able to do that. And, and I don't discount that, but yeah, once he got fully healthy, fully just, you know, warmed up and back to doing what he does best um, and making that little subtle swing change that John Mealy pointed out in one of his newsletters. Yeah. It was just lift off from there. Just like we're expecting a lift off from this off season starting very soon. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I reread that article this morning actually uh, because it's just mind blowing. They're like such a little change can drastically change the entire bat path and all the production. Uh, that you you're able to get out of out of a guy. It's absolutely amazing to kind of read the insights that Mule does with some of these articles. And yeah, Ortiz. Also, something else that stuck out to me, like going back to when we had Matt Blood on the show, and he talked about how you know, Ortiz was a guy who going into 2021, like really, or during COVID shutdown, really focused on like everything that went into his body. 
Uh, and so the nutrition side of things and really getting physically in preparing for this moment right here. And we're starting to see the results come out on the field. It's, I mean, we've been hyping them up. I feel like the last couple of weeks have been a severe Joey Ortiz hype train, but it, it's, it's well-deserved. And, you know, I, yeah, I don't really know what to say about the kid right now. Move on to another player that the four of us agree is a lock, although John Mioli wrote in his newsletter today and made, I think, a, a reasonable argument why it might not be a lock, and that's Drew Rahm, who is Rule 5 eligible for the first time this offseason. Drafted in the same class as Grayson Rodriguez, they're the same age, the difference in their ceiling, their prospect status, fairly substantial, but Rahm has been consistent year in and year out since his pro debut in 2018. Ended this season at AAA, and we did see some command struggles there a little bit that are unusual for him, but for the most part, it was another solid season. And Nick, I want to get into what I think is the biggest question mark about Rom, at least among our listeners is how is Rom different than any of the other left-handers the Orioles have protected or added to the 40-man roster in recent years with guys like Zach Lothar, Kevin Smith, Alexander Wells, um, and even Bruce Zimmerman, for that matter, who was added to the 40-man in the 2020 season. So we never really had this conversation with him. But where do you think Rom is maybe similar or different from those pitchers? I'm pretty sure, it, I don't know if it was this year or last year, our top prospect list, like the preseason list, I'm pretty, I included a note in there saying like he, I think unfairly, and it's kind of lazy analysis where he just gets thrown into that bucket of the Alex Wells and Zach Lowther type prospects in the system, which I get it. He's a lefty who there was, you know, the velo concerns for many years, but that velo has ticked up. Uh, over the last year or two. And so I think with him, of all those guys, Kevin Smith as well, Kevin Smith was protected last year. And uh, is he going to be in the organization when next season starts? I I really don't know. He's finished what the second half of the season on the development list never came back. So I think Rom is better than his ceiling is better than all of those guys, without a doubt. Um, I've believed that strongly for a while. We've kind of mentioned before, like go back and look at Zach Lowther's numbers how as he was starting moving up the system, and that was a guy, at least I know personally, I was pretty high on Zach Lothar, especially when he was in the lower levels of the minor leagues. But as Lothar was moving up, the strikeouts went down noticeably and the walks were going up noticeably. Drew Rahm was the reverse up until this past season, of course, but his strikeouts were going up, walks were going down. And I mean, this past season, I just felt like he was still producing a, a ton of strikeouts. I, I lost the numbers here in front of me. Uh, more than 10 strikeouts per nine innings in AAA and more than 11 strikeouts per nine in AA still. Like, not giving up a lot of home runs. The FIP numbers, if you look at the FIP numbers, a, a run and a half lower than his ERA, I think, at both levels. And so the biggest thing for me with Rom and why the numbers were kind of inflated a little bit was it seemed like, especially at the end of the year, when you're like, all right, he's through five innings, he's at 80-plus pitches, that's it for Rom. I'm flipping to another game. And I'm looking and Rom's coming back out for the sixth inning and he seemed to like, that's when the walks would creep up on him. The big hit would happen and he could not get through that extra inning. And of course you want to see that, but maybe he's a five and dive type guy, which that's baseball now. Right. So I, I think I don't see a big issue with that. The velo is there, the, the, the repertoire is there. He's got that arm angle. He can drop it down to almost a sidearm. Uh, I think John Mealy mentioned that too, especially to lefties. He likes to do that against, I could see why you'd say he's not a guaranteed lock, but I'd have him. I got three guaranteed locks and Rom, I would consider a lock, but I understand the hesitation why you maybe not say he's a lock. I have five locks and Drew Rom is definitely one of them. I mean, yeah, I've done, we've talked about a lot, the analysis of why he's different than the likes of Alex Wells, Zach Lothar, Keegan Aiken, even, um, Kevin Smith, like you said, from last year, like he, I feel like he's just a grade above them. You, you've you seen the velocity get to where you want it to get basically by this year. And maybe there's still room to improve, but it's plenty of velocity there for the kind of pitcher that he is. He, he's got a ton of different pitches. Like you said, he can drop down. So I think he's already in AAA. So it's not like he's, you know, you got long to wait for him. I think he will be added and he'll start in AAA in the rotation. And he's a guy that, he could fill in in a rotation and be a starter at some point, but he could also be a really nice weapon out of the bullpen, especially with the the arsenal that he has. Maybe he can even get the velocity up even more. 
in shorter stints. I don't think it's crucial to his game, but yeah, I, I just don't see any way that he's not added as even if there were more people, players in the way on the 40 man roster. I mean, there's six open spots plus m- plenty of guys that are on the 40 man that could still be removed. So to me, I could see the argument if, if it was a tighter competition, like in Tampa Bay right now, then I could understand maybe he wouldn't be protected, but for the Orioles, I think he's pretty close to a hundred percent. Yeah. When I wrote up my BSL piece, I put Rom in the category of locks. He was one of four players that I had in there because in my mind, you're looking at him as a possible starter in the major league level. And that's not something you can say about the majority of the pitchers we're going to be talking about tonight and that are rule five eligible this off season. I think the other thing too, is that the results have pretty much been there year in and year out. I think that 2022 things got thrown off for Rom a little bit at the beginning because he had that stint on the IL right at the point where he should have been ramping up and then kind of had to start that process over again when he got back. And then as Nick said, you know, they might have, there just might have been some outings in Norfolk where maybe he went out there one inning too long and maybe he was worn down by then. But I think that the everything is there for him to be a pretty capable mid to back rotation starter at the major league level. And I think he has a better repertoire than any of the left handers that we've had this discussion about in the past, whether it's, you know, Wells, Zimmerman, Lothar. Aiken, Smith. I just think that Rom is a step above all of them. Um, and then I think the other thing, too, is that you're not looking at a class where you have several position players that you might want to protect. So if it's a difference between Drew Rom and a, you know, a good outfielder, you don't have that this year. So you're really looking at pitching, pitching, more pitching, and Joey Ortiz. So, yeah, you got to figure out at that rate, all right, well, let's, you know, kind of start separating these guys out. Drew Rom could stick as a starter, and I don't think you can say that about most of the guys on this list. Yeah. You're not in a position. There are some other guys, some borderline guys, where you could say, all right, if they do get plucked, it might hurt a little bit, but like you can replace them, I think. But with Rom, like, he's right there. He doesn't need too much time in AAA before I think he's at that point where you're like, all right, it, it's sink or swim now time in the major leagues. And the Orioles rotation next year isn't going to be Grayson Rodriguez, Jacob deGrom, uh, you know, Carlos Rodon, and another trade piece. Like it's, We're not going to go from zero to a billion overnight with the pitching free agents. But So letting a guy like Rom go, I think, would be a pretty big mistake, which is why I think he's a lock right now. And actually, Vivek had an interesting question, and something I was wondering as well when thinking about this is, what does the new regime think of him? Like that's a genuine question that I had because it seems like Rom has always been this guy who at every, he was a high school pick out of Kentucky. Right. And he's been in this organization for many years now, but he's one of the few like pre Elias era prospects that's still hanging around here and having success. Clearly the organization likes him, but like you really don't hear anything from the org about him unless I'm just missing it. It's just, it's odd, like, but he's produced at every single level he's been at the guy wins and strikes out a lot of guys. Yeah. It's a good point because yeah, it's, it's true. He's very quiet. Like you hear even about guys like someone who we're going to talk about in a few minutes, Noah Denoyer. Like I feel like you hear way more about him even than, than Drew Rahm, just from the inside of the organization, at least publicly. So yeah, it's a great point. Who knows? Maybe, but even if they don't love him, I, I feel like you, they still will have to add him just because He could be a trade chip. You know, you don't want to let him go for free if you're, well, you know, you're trying to make a deal and Rom's numbers are sitting there. Like that's pretty appetizing for a, for a team that's trading a pitcher to get someone back with uh, more team control. We're getting now to, I think the other player that we all three agree is a lock and that is Seth Johnson. Now, yeah, I think that there is a little bit of a emotional angle to this because Johnson was part of that return for Trey Mancini. And I think everybody wants is anxious to see him pitch. Unfortunately, we're not going to see him for a while because he had Tommy John surgery last year. So he could, if not, will very likely will miss all of 2023. But one thing to keep in mind is that Johnson was a highly rated prospect and very deep farm system while he was with the Rays. And he has a lot of the traits that the Orioles like. 
uh, good fastball, breaking balls with a lot of spin. So unfortunately, we're not going to get to see him for a while, but everything that you read and hear about Seth Johnson points to him being someone that you absolutely should protect um, because that ceiling is so high. And also, you know, I think it's worth pointing out here that the Orioles probably wouldn't have gotten him that trade had he not been hurt. So I, I think that Johnson is a lock. And Bob, I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts, even though we haven't seen him yet, based on what you've kind of read up about Johnson, what you think of him right now. I'm very high on him. I think he was the prize of that trade. And I think they made that trade knowing that they were going to have to add him to the 40-man roster this offseason and protect him from the Rule 5, even though he's going to miss the year. So I think that was, you know, they wouldn't have made the trade for him if they weren't going to put him on the 40-man roster. So that screams lock to me. Um, I think uh, Vivek in our patron WhatsApp group posted a nice article from, I think it was 2020 or 2021, um, a Baseball America report on him saying that he was touching 99, stuff like off-speed stuff looked great. So, yeah, I think he's a... A great pitcher. I already like Chase McDermott a lot in return for Mancini and to add him starting in 2024. That's that's pretty good stuff right there. The pitching depth continues to climb and rise. And I think Johnson will be a big part of that as long as he can come back healthy, which most pitchers can from Tommy John these days. But fingers crossed. Yeah, Tommy John, definitely not a uh, a death blow anymore. And you're absolutely protecting Seth Johnson. I agree there as well. You made that trade knowing you're going to have to protect him. Upper nice fastball. The slider is a, an unbelievable pitch. I remember right after the trade watching a few of his outings. He didn't get very many, obviously, last year, but getting to watch it, a couple of his outings before the injury, and you you see it. like you, That guy's a step above, I think, a lot of, if not all, behind Grayson Rodriguez and Dio Hall, the pitching prospects in this system. And if he doesn't get injured and undergo Tommy John surgery, like he's one of the highest-rated pitching prospects in all of baseball, and there's a 0% chance that he's with the Orioles right now. Um, he did, I think him and Zach peak had surgery on the same day by the same doctor. It was very, very late in the year. So we're definitely not going to see him in 2023, but man, I, I think when he's healthy and there's not a lot of mileage on that arm cause he was a converted shortstop. I think he became a pitcher very, very late in his career. So this is a guy who you rehab him in your system now, and you can kind of mold him exactly how you want him. You know, he's got the tools, you know, he's got the floor, you know, the ceiling's there as well. And now the Orioles can kind of do with him as as they wish with with all those skill sets. And that's going to be a fun journey to follow. Unfortunately, we're just going to have to wait a whole nother year. But yeah, definitely a lock to protect. Yeah, you're not looking at a lot of miles on the arm because as Nick mentioned, he was a converted shortstop in college. So he started pitching kind of late, which I think makes his stuff and what he has shown in his brief professional career even more impressive because – Uh, Just 17 innings after he was drafted in 2019. His only full season was 2021. He was very good then throwing 93 and two-thirds innings. And then last season, 27 innings pitched before the injury. So there hasn't been a lot of Seth Johnson in professional baseball, but what we have seen so far has been really impressive. Yeah, look forward to seeing him in orange and black come spring training 2024. We'll go now to the players that – are also in the mix for spots on the Rule 5 draft. And we're going to go with a guy who I think is kind of at the top of that list and by some may be considered a lock, and that is Noah DeNoyer, who had an excellent 2022 season between Aberdeen and Bowie that was followed up by a very good run in the Arizona Fall League. He was named a fall star while he was there. And DeNoyer seems to possess a lot of the traits that the Orioles like in their pitchers. He has started a little bit in the minor leagues, but looks like he might be better suited to a multi-inning relief role in the majors. Nick, I'll start with you here. DeNoyer is a guy that we talked about a lot last season because he was such a, basically a breakout star on the mound. Um, He also got votes for us from us in our year end awards. He was one of the three pitchers to get votes for pitcher of the year. So we're obviously high on him, but Give us a little bit of background on what you saw from the Neuer this past season and why you think he's put himself in this position where we're talking about him possibly being protected. Yeah, I think he's made an extremely strong case. Like I remember our conversations last year about the Neuer being he's this intriguing arm who's having really good success, but like, are the walks going to be an issue? 
And then fast forward to this season, he's coming off. He pitched what, 50, just over 50 innings at double A level. And I think he he would have probably very likely been the 2022 Orioles minor league pitcher of the year if he hadn't gotten hurt late in the year. But he just came off, just left Arizona, the fall star, like you mentioned. And he had a 35% strikeout rate in high A and double A last year. And the walk rate went from about 10% in 2021 to 8% in high A and then 5.6% walk rate in double A. So cut down the walks tremendously. I think regardless of whether he's a potential starter or bullpen piece, like I don't, I don't really care right now, to be totally honest. I just look at the stuff and I think it's improved tremendously. Again, shout out John Mioli. He talked about incorporating the slider more for DeNoyer. And I think that was a part of his game out in Arizona. I think we talked about this before on air that he was working on a couple of those secondaries, the slider in particular, I think the changeup as well, but he's working on the secondary pitches. So I think in Arizona, that's, was the purpose there. Yeah. Make up a couple of innings, but keep commanding or refining those secondary pitches. So you feel more comfortable throwing them because he mentioned that himself, that he you know maybe wasn't hundred percent comfortable throwing those pitches yet. So you get a more opportunity to do that. And now you come out next year, probably start next year in triple a as a member of the 40 man roster. Uh, so I think, again, I've said this before that I think he's got another gear in him. And like I said, with Joey Ortiz, I think there's a, a pretty solid gap between where he's at now and where that potential is. And so it's, it's hard to leave him unprotected and risk losing pitching talent when he could possibly be a contributor in the big leagues next year for you. Yeah, this, this is my fifth lock. I, I really don't see any way Denoyer's not protected just because from the day he was not even drafted, was signed as an undrafted free agent. I feel like the organization has been talking him up and he has done nothing but backed him up at every single step of the way. Uh, I think he's going to have a starter's arsenal, whether he ends up there in the long run or not. I feel like he's he's got the stuff to be a starter mid to back end of a rotation if he hits a ceiling. But bare minimum, this guy has just a mid-90s fastball, wicked curveball, and working on a slider and changeup getting better all the time. So four good pitches, whether it's a multi-inning reliever or a starter, I just feel like he, <laughs> I feel like the organization, Matt Blood and Michael Elias, they, they love this kid so much. He's like Vivek said, the off season training partner with Dean Kramer. So he's in the mix here for sure. And I think Orioles fans are sleeping on him big time, even though, you know, we've been talking him up, talking him up all season long as he just dominated yeah, it was a little bit of short sample size because he missed a little bit of time. But, I mean, his numbers as far as FIP and strikeout percentage and all that are right up there with Grayson and company start, as far as the pitchers go. And then he had a really solid Arizona Fall League as well. Even though he was working on stuff, he still had a 4.5 ERA, which in Arizona is pretty good. And he was a fall star. And I think they wouldn't have sent him there to show off what he can do unless they were going to – add him to the 40. The only reason he was there was to get more innings in so that he can have more innings next year. And uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, sometimes you send guys to Arizona as like show them off for trades. I don't think that's what it was for Denoyer. I think he's, he's going to be on the 40 man roster. So Denoyer was not the only pitcher in Arizona who was is rule five eligible this off season. There's in fact, several pitchers who were out there, including Easton Lucas, Nick Ritzman, and Nolan Hoffman. All three of them are Rule 5 eligible this offseason. All three are very distinct pitchers, and that's something we can talk about a little bit, all with different backgrounds. Lucas is a left-hander that came over from the Miami Marlins after the 2019 season in return for Jonathan VR. Richmond was part of the Tigers organization for several years, only to be released, picked up by the Orioles this year, and actually did not start pitching the Orioles system until June, but was good over a limited sample size. Hoffman, meanwhile, was taken in the minor league phase of, rule, of last year's Rule 5 draft from the Mariners system. And although he missed a good bit of time with injury at Bowie, he pitched very well there and was excellent at the Arizona Fall League. So kind of a, an interesting mix of arms here. And Bob, I'll start with you. Do any of these three stand out as pitchers that could be protected? And if they're not protected, because there's not going to be room for all three. If, you know, if one or both of them or all three are not protected, do you think that this could be where the Orioles lose a prospect? It's possible. I mean, especially Hoffman and Lucas really pitched lights out in Arizona, which, again, is an extreme hitters environment. And they had ERAs three and under. So 
with a lot of strikeouts and few walks. Um, I don't see any of them getting protected, but I think if one of them is, it would be Easton Lucas just because he's a lefty. You heard some reports that his velocity was up pretty good. Um, He's got a starter's arsenal. Some people thought he might still have a chance to be converted back to a starter, which is interesting to say the least. But, you know, I think it's kind of like you got a bunch of these types of guys now from that 2019 draft and some trades like Lucas. But, you know, you have enough of them, which I'm I'm sure we'll mention some others as well. John Mioli mentioned a few in his newsletter. Um, Chris Resitar mentioned some on Twitter as far as who could get protected. But I don't think it would. I think you just have to cross your fingers and hope that they don't get taken. And if they do, it's like. Well, will they make it the entire year with this organization before being returned? And if if even if that's the case, you still have other guys behind them to come up from 2019 draft and even the 2021, 2022 draft as well. So uh, they're interesting players for sure. Hopefully they don't get taken, but I don't think it's the end of the world if they do. Yeah, I just, Hoffman just doesn't. I know a lot of Mariners fans were pretty high on him. He just didn't pitch at all last year. But those K to walk numbers in Arizona was like 17 strikeouts, two walks he had in Arizona. Just absurd. From a side armor, he's like this tall, lanky side armor with just pinpoint control almost, which is kind of odd to see. Uh, but I don't see him getting protected. Nick Richmond, I still don't really <laughs> know like who the guy is, to be totally honest. Like, um, I think I mentioned I found that one tweet. Apparently he threw like 90 something sliders and only hitters only got one hit off the pitch all year, which fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I think Lucas would probably have the highest odds here. I, I just think I'm looking at you mentioned pitching and there's so many pitchers and you're going to talk about more of these guys. But I'm also thinking ahead too to like the minor league phase of the rule five draft. Like some of these guys aren't going to be protected from the 40 man. We know that. But you got some other guys like Clayton McGinnis, Xavier Moore, Jake Prezina, Griffin McClarty, I mean, Tyler Birch, Stauffer, Lopridge, Conroy. I mean, so many more names you could list off there. How many of those guys get added to the AAA roster, which I don't think we're made aware of ahead of time? Because you can protect guys on your AAA roster from the minor league phase of the Rule 5 draft. So I'm, I'm sure we're going to lose at least one, maybe two, maybe even three of these guys to the minor league phase. But we'll we'll have to see. I don't. That's kind of a... We just know when they actually get picked. But as far as Lucas, the thing that stood out to me was everyone that got sent to the Arizona Fall League, Hoffman was hurt all year for the most part. Richmond was signed really late. Denoy missed some time, but Lucas never went on the IL. He had 56 innings in Bowie's bullpen, never had an IL stint, but they sent him out to Arizona. And now you've got scouts saying he's throwing 95, 96 from the left side and could be a starter. So like, I think if someone is truly believes that i don't know if that was an oriole scout or another team scout but if that's another team scout and they truly believe that and they can convince their front office hey this is a guy to bring in he could be a second or third round aren't, aren't there three rounds in the rule five draft i think so he could be a second or third round pick and then i mean yeah it's a situation where like gray finter was taken by what the cubs last year and then returned there is that issue like bob mentioned of you gotta be able to you know stick with your org you just gotta get through spring training how many guys have the orioles sent back to their teams your drew jackson's the brandon bailey's all these guys so it, it'll be interesting to see um certainly one of those relievers is going to be i think the shocker that gets added but it, i don't think it's either of the guys that went out to arizona yeah as you start drilling deeper down you try to figure out where that shocker is going to come from i agree i think it's going to come from the pitching side. And I, you know, Lucas to me would not be surprising at this point. I think maybe some of the positive reports caught some, some of our listeners off guard a little bit because the numbers of Bowie this year were okay, but not great. We didn't have a ton of eyes on him necessarily during the season, but I just have always gone back to that. They had to see something in him and back in 2019 preparing for the draft that made them, want to get him that VR trade. And I know the VR trade was a salary dump, but there had to be some trades there they saw that they liked because he was traded just months after the June draft. Yeah. And we, the salary dump, and we know that the organization just did not like the guy. So as, or as, as far as a player is concerned, they just done, did not like the player, but you're not just going to dump him for Joe, whoever down in high A, like you're going to get, they were still at that point where you needed to bring in talent. Uh, so yeah, I think when you kind of scout say an MLB pipeline using that as a piece saying, Hey, 
this guy could possibly work as a starter and throw 96 from the left side. Like I'm paying attention to that for sure. And that was a point last year when the whole Nick Vespi debates, when we had nothing better to do uh, during COVID and it was all, is Nick Vespi going to get taken because the lefty and his production and what he was doing in the Arizona fall league. And you had guys like Jonathan Mayo and all the MLB pipeline on broadcast saying, yeah, this is a guy who's going to get picked up by an organization. Well, if you're going to say that about Nick Vespi, then I think certainly you're going to say that about a guy like Easton Lucas, who's got more velo, more pitches, and had a fantastic campaign himself out in Arizona this past two months. There's a long list of players that are Rule 5 eligible. And as I mentioned, I've mentioned a few times now, it's a lot of relievers, a lot of relievers with interesting pitch traits, but maybe they walk too many batters. Maybe they haven't had a ton of experience yet. Ignacio Feliz is a guy that kind of comes to mind where it's a little bit of both. He's still raw. He has issues with walks, but in, you know, a pretty deep farm system as far as pitching went, he finished third among all minor leaguers in strikeouts. So obviously there's something there, but Nick, I'll start with you on this. Is there someone just further down that reliever depth chart that you think might surprise some people and either be the guy that the Orioles protect or the guy that the Orioles leave off and then lose him to another team. And he actually sticks. Uh, as far as like sticking, being taken and then sticking, I don't know if I see it. Like Feliz is certainly interesting. Uh, you mentioned the high strikeout numbers there, but yeah, it's going from high to the big leagues. And I mean, he, he's good, but like, does he really have that tool? I'm looking at these guys Do any of these guys have that tool that really sticks out? Like, you know, the 105 mile an hour fastball or just the insane wipeout slider. I don't know if any of them really do. Like Garrett Stallings is there. Could he be a guy? I don't know. That's just such a fascinating story still. Um, Connor Gillespie, Houston Roth. I don't see them getting added or getting picked up. Zach Peak. we didn't talk about him. I don't think he gets protected just because he's not going to pitch at all next year. Only had 11 starts in double A. The only other, there are two names I think that I, I'd mention. Three. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about Xavier Moore. I know we get a lot of questions about Xavier Moore, and I never know what to say because I never really paid attention to the guy, but the numbers were insane last year. Um, but, and I also want to talk about Kyle Bronovich, but can we talk about Cage Stroud? You're talking about these relief prospects. Can we talk about what John Mealy wrote in his newsletter this morning about Cage Stroud um, possibly being a big league contributor next year? Like, this is why I got throwing 99 miles an hour with four pitches. Um, so yeah, if you aren't subscribed to John Muley's newsletter, uh, stop, keep listening. You can keep listening. You can multitask uh, and go subscribe to John Muley's newsletter right now, because that's a nugget that I was not expecting to read at 6 a.m. when I woke up and saw that it was in the mailbox. Yeah, that was super interesting to me as well. Like that was just not something I was expecting. I mean, I followed Cage Stroud just through the box scores and saw him pitch a couple of times. But yeah, I I knew he came back at the end of the year. He had a good year with short sample due to due to injury, but I didn't know he was hitting ninety nine with hop and and working on some other plus pitches along the lines as well. And I think he mentioned someone else too in that same article, but. I can't. I, I don't have the the link right in front of me, but yeah, definitely have to subscribe to John Mueller's newsletter. It is essential. Um, a couple other guys. Well, Xavier Moore. I wanted to mention with him. He's got a great little fastball changeup combination out of the bullpen. He only he didn't pitch much just because he was a one inning guy, and I feel like he never pitched back to back games. It seemed like there was at least two or three days between appearances. But when he was in there, he was good, and he only made it to high A. I can't see him getting picked, but I do think he's an intriguing arm. Uh, out of the bullpen starting next year in Bowie. But Kyle Bronovich, if a team thinks, you know, he they don't have his medicals, I don't think. But him and Peak both hurt. I think Bronovich has a better chance of being protected. And if he's not being selected, just because there is some pedigree there, he started the year at AAA Norfolk as a starter's profile. If not that, then a, a nice reliever. And he could be back in like May or June from what I understand. But some sleepers, I will say for me, I always like Adam Stauffer, but I don't think he's getting taken. Connor Loperch is the sleeper for me just because the Orioles love him. Talked about it in the recent past, but he he made some changes. He, he saw some success. He was in the AFL last year. So 
I don't know. Maybe they protect him because they seem to love him. Yeah, I'll give a little bit of background on Cade Stroud because we actually have not seen much of Cade Stroud in the last few years between the pandemic and some of the other things that were going on as he missed time this season with injury. Stroud, a 12th round pick out of WVU in 2019. He has just 72 innings professionally since being drafted. The bulk of them at Aberdeen first when Aberdeen was a short season team and then in parts of the last two seasons as with them as a high A club. This past season, he threw only 15 innings at the Ironbirds, but those 15 innings were very good as he struck out 21 batters and walked just six. As John Muley talked about in his newsletter today, he has a sweeper among his secondaries. We know that that's a pitch that the Orioles teach and teach quite well. And he's also got a good fastball that can run in the high 90s. I would be surprised if Stroud is, I, I won't want to say I'll be shocked if Stroud's protected. It would seem like a little bit of a reach at first glance because we have barely seen him. Yet, if they do protect him, that must mean that one, he's healthy, and two, that they feel like they can let the reins off next year and he can start in Bowie's bullpen and possibly be in the major leagues later in the season. As for Peak and Bronovitz, I agree. I don't think Peak's going to be taken. And it's a shame because before he got hurt, he was building a really strong case to be added to the 40-man roster. And had the Orioles not gone out and traded for Seth Johnson, there might be an argument to put Peak on there, but I just can't see how you take two 40-man roster spots and give them the players who are going to miss all of next season when you only have a certain number of spots to give. Bronovitz is the more likely of the two because of his timeline back from Tommy Zahn surgery. But we just don't really know where he is in his recovery right now. So it's hard for us to sit here and say, yeah, Bronovitz, you know, protect him because he'll be back on the mound by June 1st and could be a contributor to the rotation late in the year or don't protect him because he's got a longer recovery ahead of him and he might not even get a ton of time at AAA next season. Yeah. I mean, he only had two starts, I think, at AAA last year. And clearly, I mean, the numbers are kind of irrelevant because clearly he was not healthy when he made those two starts. So if he comes back, best case scenario, you know, June, he's throwing in rehab games back in Delmarva and Aberdeen and working his way back. I mean, it's still not going to be until the end of the year where he's probably just starts to feel comfortable back in Norfolk's rotation. So I I don't see the Orioles protecting two guys that they're going to have to hold down a 40 man spot for. Uh, on the IL for you know, Tommy John recovery. So I think Seth Johnson is it because that is a guy, again, like I said, he's one of the top pitching prospects in baseball if he doesn't get hurt. Um, but yeah, I, back to Cage Stroud, I, I just want it to be, after reading John's piece, I want it to be Cage Stroud so bad now just because I want to see Twitter implode again on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, give me the entertainment because could you imagine seeing, first of all, no one, point. Eight percent, I'll say, of Orioles fans have ever heard of Cage Stroud before, and then you're going to look up his player profile page and see an ERA and high A last year of over eight point oh, uh, and the Orioles are going to protect him. Like, give me that, please. I I just want to see chaos ensue. <laughs> but he doesn't pitcher. have enough chaos right now, right? I know he is a good pitcher. Like I, I'm not like not to disparage him at all. If he gets added, it's well worth it. And there's a reason John wrote spent so much time writing about him this morning, but. Yeah, just give me the Twitter chaos. I'm just going to watch it keep burning to the ground. Yeah, I made us a sub stack just in case uh, Twitter goes down. So we have uh, contingency plans. <laughs> Facebook and Inst- Instagram as well. Maybe we should start using those more. <laughs> TikTok? <laughs> so just wrap up very quickly with the position player side of this. Because as I mentioned, this isn't that big of a group. Because the best players, like Adley Russman and Kyle Stowers, were added to the 40-man roster during the season. Then you had some guys that looked like coming into this year were going to have strong cases, but ultimately didn't follow through with their numbers in 2022. And that was Zach Watson and Andrew Dasbach. And then you have Maverick Hanley, who I think in a weaker year would present a solid case for getting added, but I don't think will be added because catchers just are not popular targets in the major league phase of the rule five draft. Um, so I think that the Orioles can probably leave him off and let him start next season in Norfolk. But 
Bob, Nick, uh, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't really make a case for any of these position players getting added. Robert Newstrom was one of our favorites coming into last year. Unfortunately, he had an incredibly disappointing season, so I don't think that's going to happen. Hanley, like you said, catch, there's a reason catchers aren't really taken in the Rule 5. It's because you can always find – a guy on the scrap heap, like the Orioles found like what, four or five of them just since the season ended. And now they're down to, they've, I guess, picked the one to keep around for now, Mark K something. Um, so yeah, I just, it's too much to learn. I feel like, so you're, you're not going to waste a 40 man spot on that. And not to say that Hanley isn't a great defensive catcher with offensive upside. I just think it takes too long for catchers to develop to really justify it. Maybe Greg Cullen, maybe, some teams saw something they liked in him. I, I don't know. Isaac De Leon, there's definitely some names on here that I'm like, I still love the upside of this player, but they're too far down. They have too much to go in their development to really be picked unless it's a desperate team that is absolutely obsessed with that player. So, yeah, I think there's really not much to, to say on the position side. That'll change soon, though, in the years to come. Yeah, I don't see anything either. I don't think Hanley gets protected. Uh, Dash Bach just literally just strike out or home run. I think it's like 50, 60% of his plate appearances were a strikeout or a home run. Uh, it, it's weird to see the guys like Luis Valdez and Michel Deson rule five eligible. And I feel like they're still like 18, 19 years old. Uh, but yeah, Caden Grenier, I wonder if he gets picked up by somebody later in the rounds, which I, I'm not going to be sad about that, to be honest. Honestly, looking at the positional player list, like I'm just, it just kind of makes me sad looking at the outfielders because you mentioned Robert Newstrom. Yeah, a lot of hope last year about even if he's just a platoon option, you know, that power was so real and it really started to break through last year. Could he be a contributor in the big leagues? Obviously, he wasn't last year. There's no way he gets protected. Adam Hall, like he's not going to get protected. Shane Fontana, Johnny Reiser just retired, unfortunately, you know. And he said on Instagram is back issue. So certainly wish him all the best. Zach Watson, Davis Tavares, Toby Welk, Isaac Bellini, Michelle Desson. A lot of disappointments, I think, in that group, which is a shame because we were high on some of these guys coming into last year. But yeah, it's it's Joey Ortiz, and that's about it for positional players this year. So, real quick to wrap up this portion of the show, we'll predict who we think the Orioles are going to protect. I'll start with Bob. All right. Uh, my five locks were Rodriguez, Ortiz, Rom, Johnson, and Denoyer. And I think they will trade for a player from either the Guardians or the Rays uh, to fill out that 40th and final spot before the deadline tomorrow. I'm going to say Rodriguez, Rom, Ortiz, Seth Johnson, Noah Denoyer. I'm just going to say six. I could see them only protecting five and leaving a spot open right now, pending a transaction like Bob mentioned. But I want Cage Stroud because of the chaos, like I just said. But I'll just say Easton Lucas for the prediction. I'm going to go with five as well. I think it's going to be Rodriguez, Rom, Ortiz, Johnson, and then you round out that group with Noah DeNoyer. Um, if there is a six, I feel like it's going to be one of the fall league relievers, more likely Easton Lucas. But I'll go with five for that. And, of course, we'll uh, have that covered on next week's episode when we're also slated to be joined by Orioles infield prospect Daryl Hernandez uh, is going to be coming on. So he'll be on for the first part of the show, and then we'll talk about the players that are protected. We have more ground to cover on this show, too, by the way. But first, a message from DraftKings. NFL Sundays are only getting better, and so are the incredible offers of DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Right now, new customers can bet just $5 on any NFL team to win and get $200 in free bets if they do. Check this out. Right now, everyone can earn up to a 100% boost with DraftKings stepped-up same-game parlays. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, place a same-game parlay, and combine multiple bets like which team will win, player props, and point totals. This weekend, the Baltimore Ravens take on the Carolina Panthers. And if you think Lamar Jackson and company make a big statement on Sunday, head over to DraftKings and lay down a single-game parlay over Ravens covering at minus 12.5 points and total points scored over 45.5 for plus 230 odds right now. With payouts bigger than ever, DraftKings Sportsbook is my go-to when betting on the NFL. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now 
Use the promo code on the verge and place a $5 pregame money line bet to get $200 in free bets if your team wins. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting app, betting partner of the NFL with code on the verge. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Um, recently, several players in the Orioles farm system, or were formerly in the Orioles farm system, elected free agency. Um, and there's some names you recognize from past Orioles teams on this list, such as Lewis Head, Matt Harvey, and DJ Stewart. Some guys that we've talked about a lot on the show in the past, like Brett Cumberland, Brendan Hannafy, Alexander Wells, and Jacob Nottingham. The biggest name on the list, though, Yusniel Diaz. Once the centerpiece of the Manny Machado trade back in July of 2018. And on this occasion, Bob broke out the Yusniel Diaz jersey that he bought prior to the 2021 season, not long after Diaz was added to the 40-man roster. Now, I want to go back in time a little bit here on On the Verge History. You bought that jersey. And shortly after that, we had on two guests in the span of two or three weeks, Eric Longenhagen and Alex Fast. Both of them talked down the expectations on UCL Diaz. We were still all three kind of high on him at that point, just thinking if he could just stay healthy, it's there. Bob, you you have the jersey in your hands right now. As you reflect on that and on UCL Diaz's tenure in the Orioles system, what are your thoughts? What a waste of money. <laughs> um, if anybody wants this, all right, anyone that signs up for Patreon and you want this jersey, it's yours. <laughs> first come, first serve. Uh, yeah, it has, I have no use for it anymore. But, yeah, you know, it's a sad day. At least he made his debut, Major League debut as an Oriole. He got in at bat. He saw the field for an inning or two. Unfortunately, it just, just didn't work out. Between injuries and underperformance, you know, still rooting for him to figure it out somewhere. I could see maybe like the Miami Marlins signing him to a minor league deal or something like that. So, yeah, it, it was it was a weird weird announcement, but I'm not surprised. I I mean I'm well definitely wasn't surprised to see him removed from the 40 man. I thought maybe he might stick around in AAA, but at the same time, what's the point? We have a lot of depth coming up in that position, and uh, yeah, like Vivek says, health is the sixth tool, and he just didn't have it. Yeah, so I'm just I mean it's gonna be weird. Like who's no one's going to be writing the is this the year for using the Diaz article like that was yearly required reading I feel like for pretty much any website who covered the Orioles and uh, it's going to be weird to see him not in the organization anymore um, but yeah it's it's unfortunate you know these guys not everybody's going to pan out and Diaz is just the injuries it's, he's never going to be healthy it's just not going to be part of his game so I'm not too concerned either about him finding another organization and being some breakout, you know, being the next Mike Jastrzemski. Like I don't see that in his future. I wish him all the best and I hope he does find some success and is able to stick around. But yeah, uh, DJ Stewart, I'm interested to see if he's still playing stateside or if he goes overseas next year, I could see him possibly playing and having a lot of success overseas, but I, I'm kind of glad the DJ Stewart era is uh, finally over. Alex Wells is interesting. I'm curious to know if the Orioles are in talks and trying to bring him back. I, I don't think I've, I've probably been the lowest on him of the three of us this whole time since we started this show. So I indifferent if he comes back or not. Uh, but yeah, no one else really on this list. I think really stands out. Hanafi, I know for personal reasons, obviously uh, I was shocked. I didn't realize he was already reached free agency, but yeah, he was drafted in like 2017 so, yeah, I know that the Orioles were supposedly uh, nothing confirmed here, but the Orioles do have an offer on the table back to him, but apparently so do three or four uh, other teams. So we'll see if Hanafi comes back or not. But, yeah, it's this list. It was uh, it's kind of weird to see some of these names, but time to move on. Well, Hanafi caught me so much by surprise that the reason that I found out Hanafi was a free agent was because I was preparing, you know, I was working on the article for BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com. And I thought Hanafi was Rule 5 eligible. Mm -hmm. So I start to pull together things for Hanafi to try to figure out, you know, what I'm going to write about him. And then I notice on his MILB player page, it shows his status as free agent. You know, now these moves aren't really announced the way that, you know, major league moves are, where you know when a player hits free agency, when he signs, whatever. This is flies under the radar a little bit more. 
So that certainly caught me by surprise. I do wonder if you get him back in the system, though. I, I think it would show that the Orioles were high on him because we had heard that. And I still wonder what would have happened had he not gotten hurt when he did. He might have been on the 40-man roster last year. Yeah, yeah, it really is a shame. I mean, even, you know, John at Baseball America, when he put together his list, he had Hanafi, what, 26th or 27th? Last year, he was the top 30 get, or sorry, no, what, 31st, 32nd? I think Daryl Hernandez would have been 31, if I remember all of that kind of craziness that happened there on his list. But Hanafi was just outside of, you know, John Murley's top 30 list last year. And that was before we saw Hanafi really get back on the mound from the surgery and then a missed year from COVID. He he went over two years without appearing in a game uh, because of those back-to-back. I think he was supposed to start opening day or game two of the season with the Bowie in 2021. And then it was announced he had Tommy John surgery. Uh, so really unfortunate uh, early career path for him, but he's clearly healthy and ended the season extremely strong. He's got that wipeout slider that the Orioles taught him. So we'll see where he ends up next year. Wish him all the best. Wish all these guys the best, but we'll see how many come back. Yeah. I'm, I liked what I saw from Rico Garcia. I mean, he already signed a minor league deal with the Oakland athletics, Jacob Nottingham and, and uh, Brett Cumberland were some AAA depth last year. Cumberland been around for a while, was a hot name for a second there. So Andre Singulo, another catcher that's gone. They clearly brought in some more depth on that front. So, yeah, inch- Matt Harvey, God, finally gone. Uh, yeah, just it's an interesting <laughs> group of names and is definitely an end of an era type of thing as the uh, liftoff commences and we uh, turn the corner on this rebuild. Move on now to the Arizona Fall League, which wrapped up last week. And the big highlight uh, was the performance of Heston Kerstad, who was named the league MVP. We talked about Kerstad's breakout a couple of episodes ago, and it managed to sustain itself throughout the Fall League. In 22 games, he made 104 plate appearances and posted an OPS of over 1,000 with five home runs and 17 RBIs. In reality, Kerstad had actually started to pick up the pace a little bit at the beginning of September with Aberdeen hitting well for them over the final portion of the regular season in the playoffs before going to Arizona and putting together a strong performance. So uh, I think it's been just great to see Kerstad on the field. But, Nick, what were your takeaways from his time in the fall league? I mean, my only thing with Kerstad is you got one guy saying he's rusty and can't hit – even below average or even average uh, minor league pitching out in Arizona. But yet you have literally everyone else who went out to Arizona to cover this league rave over what Kirstad was able to do. Uh, so I, I think anyone who pays attention to Orioles prospects understands who that one guy was, the outlier here. You can't argue the stats. Like I know it's Arizona. It's very hitter friendly. The pitching quality isn't great. Uh, you're playing in very hitter-friendly ballparks, but still, the guy had an OPS over a thousand. He led the league in hits. Uh, was what one home run off the lead? Um, I think Matt Mervis is going to be like the prospect darling of all of baseball going into next season. I feel like I heard that name a million times, following along to the Arizona Fall League. But I mean, Curse had even uh, Jacob Resnick had an article up here on MLB Pipeline looking at Fall League statistical standouts, and Heston Curse had also led the league in 61 total bases. That was uh, in the past, what is the line here? Kershad won this year's MVP award for that consistency. His 61 total bases paced the field by 10 and are second only to Nelson Velasquez's 74 in 2021 over the past 10 years. I mean, there's a lot of hitting talent in this league. And for him to do what he did, I think, is a testament to where he's at and what could be in store for next year. I, I feel a lot more confident in saying that next year Kershad is on Bowie's opening day roster where uh, to be fair, like the excuses, I think kind of stop next year though. Like it's, he's had the full year. He had Arizona. Let you've got to perform in Bowie next year, but he's going into 2023 on the highest note possible. Yeah. I think he also led the league in extra base hits as well, which would make sense leading in total bases and hits, but uh, yeah. So gosh, I feel like, you know, just him coming back, being healthy, even playing at all, after all the injuries he went through and all that stuff was uh, a great story. But I feel like this fall league was like, Hey, I am still the guy that got taken second overall. And this is why boom. All right. Announce his presence, announce his return. 
And then next year, start at Bowie. If he can hit like this the first few months of Bowie, I mean, he'll be in AAA before mid-year. And then who knows, off to the races to see what happens. But yeah, just a super cool story. Even if he, I don't know, regresses, quote unquote, a little bit next year off of these numbers, because like it is an offensive league. But I mean, he is just reestablishing himself as a top 10 prospect in the best farm system in baseball. And I was listening to Eno Saris's fantasy baseball uh, podcast and he was raving about him as well. Got to go watch the home run derby in the all-star game and said that, you know, he can hit for contact to all fields, but then pull the down and in ball over the, over the fence. So he's got the power. He said he could see him being like a 280 hitter with power, which yeah, I think you could take that in in corner outfield slash DH every day of the week. So just just love to see it. And uh, great showing overall for the Orioles, even though there were a couple disappointments, even like Reed Trimble bounced back uh, towards the second half of the Arizona Fall League season and performed pretty well, too. Yeah, the two other players to focus on now, because we talked about the pitchers earlier in the show, but um, Reed Trimble and Cedar Prieto didn't, Prieto struggled a little bit offensively, but a small sample size, just 60 plate appearances. Trimble, I think for him, it was just trying to get that playing time in because he lost so much of the 2022 season with a shoulder injury. Did get back to Delmarva towards the end of the year and performed well there before, I think, putting together a pretty solid run in the fall league. It's just a matter now of whether or not he can stay healthy for a consistent stretch of time. Um, because he has a good raw skill set, but so little professional experience right now. I would imagine he opens next year in Aberdeen's outfield. It's going to be interesting to see what he does. Yeah, and Trimble, he finished really strong, I think. Um, I don't have his AFL splits here in front of me, but he, he only finished with a 244 average and a 708 OPS, but he really struggled to get base hits at the beginning of the season, I know. But yeah, he showed off speed. Uh, patience at the plate as well. Nine walks in 16 games, I think, was really good. And the guys had pretty much no pro experience. I mean, very minimal pro experience. And to go up against, even if the pitching quality isn't great, he's facing a lot of guys who are a lot older than he was uh, so and a lot more experience. So I was shocked to see him, honestly. But clearly, I think the organization views him. I think we talked about this before. The organization said, you can handle this. It's going to be a big challenge for you. But they felt confident enough in him that he could go out there and it not be a complete waste. And he would actually get something out of this experience, which I think he probably clearly did. And Prieto, I said, I don't even know why he was sent out there. Was it to, you know, hopefully get some good data on him. So other teams would get a look, maybe a trade, but I, he only hit 189. He really two doubles, two triples and a home run. I mean, I think a lot of that was just he played a full season across two levels in his first year here in the U.S. So he's adjusting culturally, this whole new lifestyle change, and now you're playing in a whole new level of baseball. And so I, I don't dig at him at all for you know kind of regressing as the season went along. But that's why I'm kind of shocked where they said, okay, go play for a whole other month out in Arizona instead of just shut it down for a couple of weeks. We'll see you down in Sarasota in November at some camps. But they sent him out there for a reason. Um, and if anything, if there's one highlight, he did walk six times in 15 games. He only walked 20 times in 115 games uh, this year in the minor leagues. So that's one bright spot, I guess, for Prieto's performance. Yeah, Prieto strikes me as like a, a baseball rat, just a guy that just wants to play baseball at all times. So maybe it was like he's going to find a way to play ball. Might as well send him to the Arizona Fall League where we can – monitor him and hey if he blows up and teams can get a good look at that as well um yeah i mean the more pitches he sees from quality competition the better so it's not going to hurt that he was there even if he struggled so now he's got the off season to work on what he's got to work on rest up a little bit if possible and hopefully come in uh and get back to where he started in this season 2022 with aberdeen in Bowie next year but vivek has me excited to go to the Aberdeen Ironbirds opening day and see the outfield of Reed Trimble, Dylan Beavers, and Judd Fabian. I mean, goodness gracious. That certainly would be a good outfield. And I agree with you, Nick. Prieto was kind of surprising because he didn't really fit the mold of the typical fall league pick with like Curse out or Trimble where he was missing a lot of time. The Orioles did do this with Kyle Stowers last year, but Stowers had just had that promotion to AAA at the end of the year 
there was talk of him possibly, you know, contributing to major league level in, you know, this past season, whereas Prieto probably starting at Norfolk, um, but we'll see. Yeah, Prieto is – my computer's about to die. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, Prieto's kind of the wild card here, but it, I think he's just a really good luxury to have. Like, I mean, you've got Norby and all these other guys I think have kind of surpassed him. Favre's already showing that he can stick in the majors in some capacity. I don't know exactly what capacity yet, but in some capacity. But to have a guy like Cesar Prieto, who we know the hit tool is there, that's what made him so famous. That's what made him this high international – or this high target in an international free agency, but you know, it's I'm anxious to see what he does in year two. Cause like I mentioned this first year, obviously was a major, major life adjustment for him. So I'm curious to see what he can do. Takes the off season off now and then comes back out starts. I don't know. Does he start in Norfolk next year? I mean, maybe, uh, but even if he's starting in Bowie again for a little bit, see him outbreak, you know, Bowie's got the good offensive output numbers. He can you know, play in a little hitter friendly ballpark. Uh, get the juices flowing early on in Bowie and see what he can do next year. Good option to fall back on. Yeah, if Zach Watson started back in Bowie to start 2022, I think Prieto is going to start back in Bowie to start 2023. But, hey, it's still an opportunity that he can make the most of and quickly get up to AAA if he starts out hot. So not panicking by any means. Still think it was a quality signing, and I would do it every day of the week. Well, that does it for this week. So we will be back next week. We're going to be joined by Daryl Hernandez, the Orioles infield prospect, coming off an excellent 2022 campaign. We're really excited to have him on. And we're also going to dive into the decisions that the Orioles make on which players they protected with 40-man roster spots. As a reminder, that deadline is on Tuesday, November 15th. So chances are, if you're listening to this show later in the week, you already know the outcome of that. Check out BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com for all the latest covers on the Orioles, Ravens, college sports, and more. And while you're on the site, be sure to hop on the message board and join the discussion with fellow readers as well as contributors to BSL. And follow us on Twitter at BSL on the Verds for all the latest Orioles minor league news we're posting there throughout the week. And as Bob mentioned during the show, anyone who signs up for a Patreon membership between now and next week's show is eligible to win this gently used used Neil Diaz jersey that Bob bought a few years ago. Very gently used, I should say. <laughs> As in, tonight's the only time you've ever worn it. And when I modeled it for a, a picture when I bought it, yes. <laughs> so very gently used jersey. We have memberships starting at as low as $3 a month. So head over to Patreon now to check those out. And we will have daily or, excuse me, weekly content resuming on Patreon soon. Um, For Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Sweden. You've been listening to On The Verge. That'll do it for this week's episode of On The Verge. Be sure to check out our Patreon page where you can help show your support for the show and get bonus content, including monthly top 50 updates to our prospect list and daily game recaps during the season and much, much more.